Welcome to AP European History with Dr. Borovkin. Today we're beginning a series of lectures on the French Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, so at first I'd like to say a few words about all of them generally. Why they're called in, why is it called Enlightenment? What were the general ideas they all shared? And why are they called philosophers rather than philosophers? So Enlightenment obviously means that they saw the light, that they saw some ideas that was different from anything else before. Uh, and, that, and here I would like to um, uh, outline five theses, five points, which I believe all of them would agree. And by all, I mean people like the most important ones, the most famous ones, Voltaire, Diderot, uh, Rousseau, uh, Montesquieu, Olbach, Helvetius, uh, and several others. So these are the major thinkers of the French Enlightenment. So here, here are these ideas uh, that uh, I think all of them would say, yes, I agree. Number one, all ideas come from sensation. Uh, that is for your, your vision, your touch, your, your, your eyes, your ears, what you hear, what you see, what you could experience, sensation. Sensation is provoked by external factors. Mind, number three, is the product of the experience. Mind, human mind, is a product of experience, not of God. Uh, there is no such thing as soul. Soul is an invention. Soul is the mind, and the mind is the product of experience. Experience create character. So what people experience create what they are as people, as their character. Character can be changed by education. And from here comes the natural uh, c consequence or follow-up. Education can create a better society. Therefore, you need enlightenment, which means education, which means society can be changed for the better, not by God, but by education and character of men. So I think most of these people would agree to this. Uh, and that brings uh, uh, the definition of philosophy versus philosophers. Now, philos philosophers or philosophy are those people who think about the way things are, about the nature of things, about the nature of nature, nature of society, nature of uh, economy, and so forth and so forth. The, the, the reason that they use this term philosophs, uh, the French ones, it's a French word, philosoph, is because there's something more than just believe in the natural law uh, that unites them. And that particularly is uh, opposition to Catholic Church or Catholic Church plus Christianity or opposition to Catholic Church, Christianity, and any religion at all. Now, there are different degrees in this. Uh, some of them were in opposition to the Catholic Church, such as Voltaire. Uh, there are others that uh, are in opposition to Christian religion as well. Uh, that would be um, atheists like Olbach and Helvetius and Diderot. And there were some that went even to a point of, of uh, denying any religion uh, whatsoever. Uh, so the reason that that actually happened is, is, and this is crucial for understanding the whole period of French uh, enlightenment, that the reason for that is that in Germany and in, in England, you had a transition from Catholics to, uh, to Puritanism or to Lutheranism, which, uh, which fought uh, against the most absurd idiocies of the Catholic religion in a kind of a halfway uh, rebellion that created new morality and created a new way of life and allowed people to do things, uh, les affaires. Whereas you could stay a Christian and still be relatively free in your entrepreneurship, in your morality, in your activity. Uh, in France, uh, one could say that uh, the Catholic Church uh, did its own quite a disservice by being the super monopolist. In other words, uh, Huguenots were expelled, a million people, but, but those that remained were persecuted. In other words, there were pretty tough laws uh, enforcing what you could call dictatorship of the Catholic Church in France. Well, for example, 
marriages of Huguenots were not valid. They had no civil rights. Uh, the, the, the Huguenot priests who, who married people could be arrested and burned and killed. Uh, they, they didn't have any right to exist at all. In other words, there was a kind of a complete dictatorship of the Catholic Church over everything. And on top of it, they thought that they knew everything better, beginning from science to society. And on top of it, they didn't pay any taxes. And on top of it, they burned books, as we will hear the biographies of these people, you know, all the time. All Diderot's books arrested and burned. All the books of Voltaire arrested and burned. It was a pretty tough uh, ideological, political, and economic dictatorship. And that got the backlash. And the backlash is down with this ridiculous church. And some of them went further down with the church and what they stand for, which is Christian religion. And some went even further and with any religion as superstition and ridiculous fables. So that's the background. But now, um, yes, and to, to, to back up what I'm saying, here's uh, uh, what Marquise de Argenson, who is one of the, uh, one of the main leaders of uh, French Enlightenment, a uh, philosopher wrote in 1753, this is what he wrote. Religion is a medley of superstition. Uh, there was some freedom of God in 16th century in Germany. As our nation is enlightened, they will expel the priests, abolish the priesthood, and get rid of all revelation and mystery. So this is just one of many examples you would hear of a kind of a rebellion of the French philosophers against Catholic Church and against religion. Uh, now, let me move on to uh, each one of them. We'll speak about each one of the major speakers. And the first one today I will focus is on uh, Montesquieu. Uh, it's, uh, Montesquieu is, is uh, a little bit apart from the crowd. I mean, all the other ones, we're going to talk about Voltaire and Diderot and Rousseau and, and uh, uh, Helvetius, they actually gathered in one salon. They were all friends. They were, well, some of them were friends, other them were not so friendly, but at least they all knew each other. And they all wrote for Encyclopédie. And they all co communicated throughout life for various projects. Uh, Montesquieu is a little bit apart. Uh, he, they did read him and they didn't know him and his ideas were widely shared, but he's not a part of the gang, so to speak, because uh, he wrote a little bit earlier. Uh, and he was uh, a marquis, he was a nobleman, and he also was the chair of the Bordeaux Parlement. So he's, he's a spokesman of a kind of a aristocracy. Uh, his uh, landed estate, he's a, he's a noble, he has the landed estates, he has uh, peasants and uh, uh, serfs, etc. But most importantly, as the president of uh, Parlement of Bordeaux, he had a great political influence on regional affairs. Uh, so uh, his thinking begins with the opposition to the idea l'état c'est moi. Uh, he, he kind of goes back to Louis XIV and he thinks this is the wrong turn. Uh, this is uh, where um, France went in the wrong direction. Uh, what is the correct direction? He is, just like Voltaire, very much in favor of uh, Britain in England, uh, where you have peers who uh, asserted their right uh, to control the king uh, and to be e equals with the king in terms of uh, policy and law. Uh, so he basically thought that uh, Louis XIV, l'état c'est moi, is a humiliation of nobility, that he made clowns out of them by uh, creating these meaningless jobs of uh, carrying of slippers or any other idiotic jobs in the Versailles. So he, this is the origin, that in France, uh, aristocracy is humiliated, diminished, and destroyed by the king. So that is a very important point. This explains why high aristocracy resent the kings. Uh, not the kings as institutions, but the kings they developed in France as kind of a usurpation of all power uh, to the king rather than sharing it as it should be, uh, such as the House of Lords in England. Now, but that's of course only the beginning. Then he goes much farther. 
uh, and he begins to think uh, his first book was actually on the Roman uh, Republic. And he has a great admiration for the Roman Republic. And he feels that uh, a republic is the, uh, uh, potentially is the best form of government. He writes also a book, uh, in this book he continues to discuss uh, why Roman Republic turned into tyranny, which is empire. Uh, and what caused the decline of Rome. And when he thinks about the decline of Rome, Roman Empire, he, of course, draws parallels with to, today's France, with France of his age, uh, which is decline of morality, decline of the quality of government, uh, and, the, um, and decline of morality of the laboring classes. Uh, and he sees all of these things are uh, in his contemporary France. So that's, again, a kind of interesting idea. You have an aristocrat uh, who actually praises the republic as the good form of government republic because the Romans hated the idea of a king uh, in the republican times. This is the worst thing that could happen, is have a king. So uh, this is a kind of still an introduction to his major ideas. And, and, and uh, if, if he had stopped at that, he would already be a kind of a remarkable person aristocrat praising republic, but he went much further than that. His next book is quite interesting for a Muslim audience because it's called Persian Letters. And actually, when I was 17, I, it was one of the first books I read uh, on political, uh, uh, political theory. Persian Letters is an imaginary letters of uh, Persian travelers who write to uh, an emir in Persia about what they see in France. Uh, as a form uh, of critique. Basically, what he does is kind of a criticizing uh, the uh, ridiculous nature of the government in France from the point of view of an Oriental person uh, and the Muslim. And of course, he takes, he pokes at the Catholic Church and at the ridiculous fables that they feed the, the, the populace, uh, that, that they, uh, you know, that they put the church way above God. Uh, and the church is God itself, and makes all kinds of allusions that he can get away with because uh, these are the Muslims who are saying it. What do you expect from the Muslims? They're supposed to be uh, disbelievers in, uh, in Jesus. And finally, he moves on to his most important book, uh, which is called L'Esprit de, de Loi, The Spirit of Laws. Uh, and in the beginning, he kind of uh, goes into discussion of the climate and geography and national character. And when I read it, it, it reminds me of Ibn Khaldun, who also you know, was the first one to uh, draw the connection. He's probably the greatest historian that ever lived. Uh, and uh, Ibn Khaldun uh, does, is the first one to, to delineate geography as a as, as shaping character and the national character and the development of nations through the cycles of historical development. So he kind of follows him in this, and he uh, has, you know, at least half of the book is about the climate and how climate and geography changes the way the nation is, and also shapes its religion uh, and, and how religion has to match a national character, such as Islam matches the southern character and uh, uh, Christianity supposedly uh, matches the European character. But I think all of that also he would not have been remembered if this was just at that. There was no new breakthrough in the discussion of geography and character. His greatest contribution uh, does come in this book, in the uh, uh, key idea, which becomes a fundamental, central pivot of enlightenment. Uh, and that is the idea of the separation of powers. Uh, thinking about the good government, uh, the way government should be organized. Uh, Montesquieu comes to the idea that uh, power, political power, should be divided into three parts. The uh, legislative power uh, that is done by the parliament, the executive power, which is the government accountable to the legislature, accountable to those to create laws, and the judicial power that should be separate, and that was his branch. This is the Parlement 
they are the judicial branch. They approve the laws. They should verify the laws. Uh, they should make sure that the laws are uh, in uh, accord with the Constitution and that they're good for the people. Separation of power was the biggest breakthrough that, as we know, uh, it, it, it became a part of American Constitution. And even before that, it, it created a huge impact on the two most important reformers of the 18th century, which is Frederick the Great and Catherine II. Uh, they all, and of course in England as well, they already practiced separation of power. Uh, so one could say that with this uh, first reflection uh, on government, uh, given the fact that John Locke has already existed and been known, uh, a revolution has begun, a mental revolution has begun, a revolution of rethinking what the government should be like. It could be a republic, it could be a constitutional monarchy, but it should be a government that has uh, separation of powers to avoid tyranny, to avoid l'état se moi, to avoid the system of a dictatorship of either of the government or of the church of, of any one classes. So, uh, that's the first installment. Uh, don't forget to put your likes and to subscribe to AP European History with Dr. Brofkin. And then you'll hear a whole lot more about uh, wonderful thinkers of France in coming lectures. <laughs>